Yes, it is Hot 97. So tonight, super exciting. I was talking about this earlier, but tonight uh, there's a rock doc on VH1 that starts airing tonight. Four, uh, four part special of Tanning of America. And I have my guy, Steve Stout, in the building today. Hey. Of course, the author of best selling book, Tanning of America, Industry G. OG. OG, feel, yeah. You feel uh, like an OG? You have to at this point, right? Yeah, well, you know, when you have a four in front of your number. Yeah, you four. To, that you four bet, changes yeah, the game, right? You got to be like, yeah, well, I am an OG. Well, the OGs yeah. are important because they give the perspective. They tell the story. You need people who were there to tell the story of how we even got to this point. Yes, you do. Um, and that's really why I wrote it. That's why I wrote the book initially. I feel like we all played a very important part. This station, um, the people involved in hip hop, when you start talking about, you know, from the mid 80s till now, um, that has played a very important part in spreading the culture of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Whether you like certain songs or not is not even the point. It's the culture that came of the music mm -hmm. that spread and created a global culture in which people connected and understood each other by. And hip hop is like a code that did that. And uh, I, I, I feel 100% that hip hop did more to bring people together than anything since Dr. Martin Luther King. I've always felt that. I said that in the book. I say it any chance I get. Um, and the, you I, are one of the people. Uh, now you're not the only one. A lot of people would would say that. It, of course, it, it put when you uh, Obama say, in the in the uh, White well, House. Well, and, I mean, there's a there's a there's a chapter 1520 Cedric Avenue to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, because I believe that hip hop's birthplace is a direct result to the presidency of the United States. And I I connect those dots throughout the book. Um, the documentary goes a little bit wider than just talking about the uh, uh, President Obama and. Um, you know, the, the, the vote, the, the getting youth out to vote and put a president in office. The craziest thing when you go through the documentary, and it happens in episode four, is Puffy, nine years ago, interviews a young senator, man, and tells him, I believe that one day you could be president, and when you run, you call, call me, man. You're inspiring. And that was young Barack Obama, and you see him looking at Puff like, this is Puff Daddy. You actually, we have that. We we show Amazing. that. It's outrageous. Yeah. You know, and you know Puff was doing the ready, or, you know, uh, vote or die and rock you the vote. What, you He's been doing so all funny. that. And you think about it when you compile all of the, you know it's, what it is, is when you compound it all, sometimes you forget all of the things at the beginning, happened. the middle, and the end. Yeah, and that, I didn't want that to go down, Angie. And we look back on this, and we're just the generation that was like blinged out and champagned out. No, and you wanted pants. credit for that. I want this generation. Yeah. And I, all I did was in write the book was write the book really for all of us, so that there's a document that sits there that you could always go back to and refer to. That was like, no, this happened because of this, and that was the most important part of this. You know, for me, watching it, I always have a thing like. I like, you know, I like people who are confident, who like to think big and think beyond, but sometimes arrogance offends me, right? Yeah. But watching this and and looking at some of the boundaries that people or the doors that people knock down, it took it took a bunch of arrogance to get there. It took it took unapologetic, so unapologetic, unapologetic arrogance. arrogance. It really did. Starting clothing lines when you can't even sew. Yeah, it really did. I was People watching are doing everything. The one of the parts they're talking about Will Smith and how Will Smith he was a rapper and he was managed by Benny Medina and Benny Medina had the idea of I want to put him in a movie and I don't want him to be like wearing gold chains and being in that type of movie. I want him to do a Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. And the audacity to think that in the moment. I mean, now it seems like yes, of course that makes sense, but at that time. It's it's the, arrogant. You know, it's like and, ballsy. And, and, it's well, like, that, you know, yeah. and, and it, I'm gonna switch uh, switch subjects, but it makes sense. It's analogous. People make comments about Kanye West, and you know, I was gonna ask you what you your know, thoughts are on thing, that. His thing and the rants and the clothing business and fashion won't let him in and all this other stuff, and and then they think there's arrogance in that. You know, how can I? How would I ever think that a guy from Chicago, who was a producer? Who's getting selling beats third party to other people? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, becomes one of the biggest rappers in the world. And after he would from Chicago, and his jaw is wired. I mean, if you went through that experience, you would believe you could do anything too. So of course, I support. He's a dreamer, and his dreams got him to this point. And I don't think that he should stop dreaming because people are like upset and feel like, well, he's going too far to get into court, the couture fashion. He's not going to do that. Who is? You know, people thought I was crazy to get into the advertising business. Right. You leave the president of Interscope to go start an advertising business? What are you, crazy? Mm. It's the audacity to do that. You don't even have a college degree. How are you going to go tell McDonald's without a college degree what's right and what's wrong? 
mm -hmm. you going to put that information together when you have to go up against the guys from McKinsey and Baines and these big consultant firms that are filled with brainiacs? Because hip hop gave me the audacity to believe that I can get it done and the work ethic to get it done. That's a very important thing. That's what it. That's part of the culture it that really keeps driving. Really All is. these guys are in businesses and, and, and inspiring people to go in businesses and they're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's make it happen. Andre Harrell used to always say, make it happen. I've heard Puff say, make it happen. And it was just like, figure it out, man. Be resourceful and figure it out. One of the things, too, because a lot, a lot of what Tanning of America is um, points out, too, is, you know, um, the, the value in the hip-hop culture, the value in our artists in terms of, like, uh, making money, marketing them, uh, being able to make money for brands, for companies, which yeah. is how you've made an amazing living for yourself. But I, So I was looking at the original ways, and, and I was watching Dre and, and Snoop talk about how they, you know, they put Tangeray in Gin and Juice videos, and all of a sudden Tangeray's... Yeah, a dollar started, right. Yeah. But don't you feel like back then it was kind of more organic, where now it's like product placement well, is so obvious? <laughs> so well, I, like, I, I take some of the blame for that. You do, right? um, you, should, you probably should. Yeah, I, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> the, it was organic. Mm -hmm. I think LL Cool J wearing Kango hats was organic. Yeah. And, and run and uh, run DMC wearing Adidas and everything else was. And, um you know, whether it be gin and juice and Tanqueray or Pasta Cavassier or whatever it was, brands had gotten a lot of benefit from, you know, the fact that these artists was using brands to profess who they were and it was their stature. And, mm. you know, the bigger the brand, the more respect you had. And, and those kind of things led to uh, growth for these companies, but yet they never wanted to associate themselves with hip hop because they felt like it was beneath them. And all those same brands ended up um, hoping and praying that that gravy train continued. Then all of a sudden you see Puff start his own alcohol company and then start their own clothing companies. And, you know, it's become less and less that kind of free promotion yeah. deal. Now you got to do deals with people in order for them to do that generally. And I, I think that, you know, hip hop gave a lot of money away and created a lot of brands. And a lot of people got a lot of rich off of it without... Um, the artists themselves who were promoting these companies benefiting from that. But, you know... Is it as effective now, though, that it's not as organic? Is it as effective? I mean, for some people it is, for the for the big, you know, for the J, the well, Puff. If it's, I know, if it's honest. I think if it's honest, it works. I think that, you know, Puff would have a hard time selling sneakers, but he could definitely sell Ciroc. Mm -hmm. Like, he is that guy. Like, when you see that Frank Sinatra ad, you believe it. You've seen him do that. He does that. Yeah. He's the man with the white party and everybody shows up. Yeah. So I, th I still think that there are ways you can sell product if your relationship with that category is, is authentic and people believe that you're selling something that you believe in. I, I think that always works. Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever put somebody with a product that it was just like, that was a terrible <laughs> idea? Because we see that all the time. People start. No, I, I don't. I've seen that a lot. And I could say that I have not, I have not done that. I, I, I've, I've not done that. Really? No, I've not put. But first of all, I'm not. That's not the core business is putting rappers with uh, uh, musicians, rather, with uh, with brands. That's not my core business. I do communications. And if that's an idea that comes out of it, then that's what we do. But I had not made any, you know, mistakes that were made was more like, you know, I put T.I. with GM to sell the Chevy Impala, which made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And he had the song Top Back at the time, and then he gets locked up for guns. I had to deal with that. What you know, happens? You get you the know, call? Or I do a deal with Wrigley, and Chris Brown make the song Forever, which is the Wrigley jingle. It's blowing up. It's crazy. I'm, like, feeling like a genius. And then all of a sudden, I wake up the morning of the Grammys, and... He's in jail. Had the Wrigley's on commercial the run. even run? It, like, no, the Wrigley's no, the Wrigley's commercial had just started to run, and it was just revealed. How much money did that spend? forever really was the Wrigley jingle turned into a song? How much money was lost? Do you think in that? A lot. Well, I can't think. I can't quantify the money. There was a big opportunity loss for everybody. Yeah. Wow. Worst. Those were the worst too. Yeah, those were the worst. So I had one long when Justin Timberlake had the uh, malfunction with J uh, Janet. I was under a McDonald's deal with Justin. That was also uh, something I had to deal with. And you know, in the beginning, I used to do it, and I would like look at the thing, and I'd be like, "Man, Ti got locked up for guns," and I'd be like, "What is he doing?" And then I'm like, "Wait a minute, I gotta get in front of this. <laughs> I gotta put this guy with General Motors. I gotta. Yeah. I'm responsible for this." 
you know, I, and I realized quickly that I can't just watch it. I have to actually drive the outcome. What was the best one you've done? The best one. I think the best stuff. Um, I think the Jay Z HP ad when they only showed half the body that was, was ridiculous. Yeah. I think um, that was creatively mean. That was just retarded yeah. at the time, like during the NBA Finals. Um, I think even when we launched all those sneakers, like like Allen Iverson and Jada Kiss in the commercials back then, and and like the S Carters and then the G units. I think like just selling sneakers was just really smart at the time because Air Force One had, was so dominant. It was just a way to cut in. That was really cool. Um, I don't know. That's got to be amazing. Uh, yeah, That's like got to be so dope some to of that stuff. Back. Even to watch this doc, right? So it's four series. Wait, so the doc airs tonight is the first part, right? Yeah, tonight, it's four uh, parts. Four, it's tonight, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. It. Are you going to cry when you watch to, it? No, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> 42 interviews with... You know, but I mean, that's got you got to feel like you had such a hand. That, I mean, it's got to be. That's got to feel. That. I, it it does feel good. Yeah, it, it, it feels good. I can't get caught up in that right now. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. know when I look at everything in hindsight, you know, I'm gonna feel proud about my contribution to to this to this business and and, and, and to the culture that we all you know have been a part of developing and and professing. So. Um, you know, it's cool. And, and and the truth of the matter is, you know, we all have played a role in contributing to that. No one's ever going to say, you know, what did Hot 97 do? I remember Hot 97 would play dance music. Mm -hmm. I remember it like it was yesterday. They would play dance music. And it was Flex playing, you know, coming in playing hip hop a little bit. And Steve Smith was here. And they changed the That's format. Crazy. But when that happened, there was no way for hip hop music couldn't even get played mm -hmm. in New York the right way. It was getting played at two in the morning and weekends. You know, and mm -hmm. weekends and it wasn't getting played. And then you guys blew it open. And when you guys started playing it with the bandwidth of Hot 97, all of a sudden you have kids in Greenwich, Connecticut getting caught up on the flavor. But you know what that did? That caused the conversation. That was the introduction of this new art form. So between Hot 97 and UMTV Raps, you got these kids now understanding, you know what? I actually can relate to these guys who are these hip hop artists and kind of what they're talking about. It makes sense to me. I like this. And that's how you chop change the world. But that would never, ever, ever be, get quantified correctly unless something like this came out hmm. and provided that, that platform for that dialogue. I don't feel like everybody um, creates that platform for radio. I feel like radio is like the lost little piece of the puzzle that never something? gets the credit. I give credit. credit. Let me tell you something. Right. Shout out to all the radio people across the country, I, all I the can, world. I feel I like we are so like the time. little engine that never really properly gets. Radio um, mm -hmm. was the key for why I even started an advertising agency. Really? Yes. Because what happened was. Because the ad sucked and you, <laughs> you were no. like. No. Oh. What happened is radio is the closest with dealing with the movement in advertising spend because mm. you guys have local like car dealers and you know you take radio right yeah. they, it has to affect it locally so for instance when you've seen z100 and they would never play rap music all of a sudden their sponsors started going wait this kid wants to hear nelly they want to hear they had to play it because the advertisers were feeling the fact that their advertising wasn't getting the right people in their offices so or in their dealerships or whatever it was. So I always felt like a radio was so close on the front line of media. And radio had to play, you had to all of a sudden play a different assortment of music in order to get the massive, uh, the, the maximum of uh, audience that the, that the market had. However, when you go to television, they have black, White. They put them in demographics that you had to buy it. Like if you want to buy black, you buy BET. If you want to yeah. buy white, radio didn't have that. And I felt like everything was going to turn into radio. That advertising had to respond. Has it? Yet? Um, it's getting there. Mm. Every it, it had to turn into the way radio treats playing their playlists. Mm -hmm. What we have to play was hot. I felt like advertising had to do the exact same thing. Mm. They had to just play the hits, and as a result. You're starting to see format changes. You've seen format changes at radio, at Churbin, and all these ter terms that make yes. no sense. Um, <laughs> but it was a way to uh, captivate advertisers, and and that's why I feel radio is important. When the Kanye was up here, you know, he clearly had a, he clearly had an agenda. His his agenda was to to break down some of these walls, I guess, in, in that world. Do you feel like they're there? Do you feel like they're? I mean, do you feel like? I don't know. Do you feel like it's possible what he's talking about? And yeah, you do. Yeah, I think that he, I think that his approach has to be, 
you know, he spent a lot of money and he's put a lot of time and effort in. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's breaking down walls for either himself or somebody else is going to be a part mm. of it. But if you look at what, like, Pharrell's been doing it for years. I mean, Pharrell tells me a story that he's on the front row of uh, Mark Jacobs' fashion show. And he has on the bathing ape glasses. And Mark Jacobs sees him after the show and says, where'd you get those glasses? He's like, well, I designed them for bathing ape. He goes, what inspired you? He goes, well... It was some glasses that Versace had, that Biggie had. And then there was a scene in Scarface where Tony Montana was walking by the poolside. I and I took those two ideas <laughs> oh, and I, I made him. these glasses. So then he said, well, could you make glasses for Louis Vuitton? That was the first time Louis Vuitton ever made eyewear. It's Pharrell designed. So of course those walls could be broken. I love, I love that story. There's so many great stories like that, by the way, in the documentary. Yeah. There's one that they talk about Tommy Hilfiger, how he, he lived in the city. and I mean, he lived in Connecticut and worked in the city and would purposely drive the up long Park Avenue. way up Park Avenue all the way to Connecticut so that he could drive through Harlem every day Yeah, so he could see what everybody was and, wearing. And he would use that to make fashion to, for his fashion cues. And then Bloomingdale's told him that he's bringing the wrong audience inside the store and they were going to kick him out. How about that? How about Tommy Hilfiger was told didn't that he, he was going to get thrown rap? out of Bloomington? Didn't he get quoted as saying something that was like a... And then, yeah, something that he didn't like black people yeah, or something. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was cleaned up later. But the fact of the matter was um, he got inspiration from watching, driving up to Harlem and just watching fashion that was coming from hip-hop sensibilities. And he built a billion-dollar business as a result of it multi-billion dollar business as a result of it. Amazing. And he talks about it. He says his business broke wide open um, when one day when uh, Snoop Dogg wore, uh, Snoop Lion now, <laughs> wore uh, Tommy Hilfiger on Saturday Night Live. It changed his life. He says this openly. I don't know if he's sending Snoop a check. Isn't it amazing with all that information out there? When you watch it, it's amazing that all of this information, all these facts, and that people could still kind of front on the culture <laughs> in places. There are still can people. You, isn't that crazy? It's really kind How of can crazy. You? Sh- like, it's like really what else is the? Crazy. What does it have to do? Yeah, no, no, it's really kind of crazy. It's un- it's it's ridiculously unfair that for anybody to even blink on the power that this culture has and the effect it has on shifting the world. What's the future of the culture? Well. The unfortunate thing is when things get big, uh, it gets homogenized. Yes. And when it gets homogenized, you get a lot of um, riffraff. And fast food? Things that, huh? You get a lot of fast food? A lot of fast food, <laughs> a lot of 2% milk mm-hmm. um, of the culture itself. And, you know, over time, there's a new culture that emerges. But, you know, this one clearly made a contribution to society that was much bigger than introducing gold chains, gold teeth, and baggy pants. Do you feel like the biggest part of it is past us, or do you feel like it could, there's still room for growth? Well, there's always. I mean, with Puffy with Revolt right now, what does that mean? Is that could that be Viacom one day? Mm. You know, and then what does that mean after that? I used to think I, I had this analogy, like you know, I don't know how many people I'm showing sure my age, but like like Pac Man was mainstream, and like yeah, like you know, it, you didn't realize Pac Man wasn't really mainstream till you realize what mainstream looked like, like with Call of Duty. Like, that's mainstream, right. you know? So you always think it's over, and then you see the real version of it later down the line, you know, 20 years later. So when guys like Jay-Z gets, you know, the power to control media, or Puff gets the power to control media, that's when you start to realize the the the, the, um, the length and the, the depths that it can go when those guys are making decisions to help change the landscape of communications. So I think there's a much longer way to go because we still haven't gotten to the top where we can make all those decisions right now. I just feel like the, the I don't know, I feel like maybe even watching that and seeing how much was out there, I mean, from the Will Smiths to the Puffs to the Jays to the, I feel like now um, uh, of the new batch, I don't, see, I don't see as much growth happening we still have the J. You saw Puff is growing, and the, you know you've yeah. got the Rock and Dr. Dre has beats. Yeah, uh, I don't see the next layer of that evolving. You're gonna see. I think you're gonna see. Way. You know, I, I, look. I, you know, I, I'm waiting to see somebody that comes out the hip hop community create a great gigantic technology platform. I don't know why. You know, we could we couldn't develop Twitter or, or mm. Instagram or 
you know, or WhatsApp, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's going to come next. So it may not be somebody directly that came out the music business, but it could have been somebody who the music business, the hip hop culture inspired, yeah. and therefore they understand the rules and the code, and they put people on who, you know, are down with that understanding, you know? And I think that's a big part of it as well. So it's not only guys directly from the music, but people who grew up that the culture influenced being able to make decisions and developing things that we could all partake in. I love that. I'm going to try to find that person. Today. You're going to find that person today? <laughs> I'm going to find today. Yeah, well, I don't know who to call, but, <laughs> but whoever, that, that, whoever that is, and tell me I can invest in that stock. All right. So uh, if you listen, the book has been out and it was a bestseller, but if you, if you, you can still get it. You can, you can still, still buy the get, book. In fact, the, the book, book we had next week. The Tanning the book, of America. Next week, the book comes out an ebook in two weeks. It was never an ebook? It was never an ebook, and Kerry Washington read the book. So we have Olivia that. Pope reading uh, uh, The Tanning of America, which is pretty cool. That's pretty great. Yeah. And then the, um, tonight starts on VH1 at, I didn't have the time. 11 right. o'clock. 11, 11 o'clock. Why'd they put you so late at night? See how they treat us? No, no, no. no. I'm just well, you know, they're putting on, well, they got to deal with um, every desperate housewife oh, uh, yes. situation first. Yes. So I had to stay clear of that every action. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally understand that. On Wednesday, I'm one at nine o'clock. Uh, oh, have, you got you. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we move around because of the action. They're gonna get a lot of. They'll, they'll get a lot of burn too. I think, and then they'll live forever. Those pieces will live forever. Oh, those really things, great. Uh, Even if you're not interested in financially betting, benefiting from the culture of hip hop, it it will take you back it, 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 through like a, a journey. It's really, really a great doc. The journey, uh, the contribution. Um, Connect the dots on things that you didn't even realize that mm -hmm. you were personally a part of making happen in America and around the world. And um, I think that people are going to be surprised when they watch it. And it's not just like the super educational thing. It's funny. You know, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I, I made a point to uh, make it entertaining as well as um, educational so that you feel like, you know, you're learning something and connecting and it's dots, but you also don't get bored because you're watching it and it's funny. Right. That kind of thing. The Tanning of America. Is that what the, the, the doc is called? Tanning of America. The Tanning well, of right? America. Tanning Amer One of America. Nation Under Hip Hop, VH1, uh, the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's always, always a pleasure. Yeah, always a good time. One time, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> We're outside 87. All right. Amazing.